The Tom Woods Show, episode 1994. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you enjoy The Tom Woods Show, it's time to go to the next level. And next level Tom Woods is libertyclassroom.com. This is where my friends and I teach all the stuff you did not get in your conventional education, history, economics, and more, the way it ought to be taught with all the content they left out or distorted. Check it out at libertyclassroom.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. Today, I am joined by entrepreneur Peter Rex, who, as he was passing the bars for New York and Massachusetts, created a multi-billion dollar real estate business at the same time and then moved to Silicon Valley to learn tech. And his hope is to dissolve leftist domination of big tech by simply out-innovating them and helping to foster a new generation of tech leadership. Peter, welcome to the show. Tom, great to be here. Thanks. All right, look, you're a very interesting guy. I've just spent a solid day watching videos of yours and finding out more about you. I don't know how somebody gets kicked out of a Montessori school. I mean, the whole point of it is to sort of be your own person. <laughs> but you have a uh, biography that's quite interesting. I saw that even at Harvard Law, apparently, what I read, you're one of two people Elizabeth Warren is said to have failed, but then you challenged it, and we were allowed to take the exam, and you passed it anyway. So what do you attribute all this to? You have such an interesting and odd bio and have had such success professionally. Yeah, well, Tom, I really appreciate that. It's very complimentary. And I would say it's everyone's created uniquely. And, you know, that could be a problem with our education system more so than with me, actually. And, you know, I, I have a personality that's creative, extremely focused, very driven, but I can also be highly distractible. So that's partly why I think school was really not for me. I'm also not really one for authority. That might be why I gravitated towards uh, the Tom Woods podcast. So, <laughs> having uh, libertarian leanings myself. But I think, you know, these traits, these attributes of myself actually turned out to be appropriate for entrepreneurship. And I'll give you a little backdrop of myself and then we can get into different ideas or things you, wherever you'd like to go with things and we'll, we'll just run with it. But quick backdrop is grew up in upstate New York, Irish Catholic family. And, you know, as you said, I got kicked out of Montessori school, always had problems with uh, administration and, you know, authority, stuff like that but always wanted to serve people, which sort of comes through on that Catholic type thinking or Christian thinking, whatever you want to call it. Thought maybe I'd become a priest to kind of, you know, unleash that missionary desire to serve people. Went to the seminary for a little bit. That didn't work out due to authority reasons again. And uh, from there, I went, worked construction, went to community college, then transferred to Ava Maria, which is a small Catholic liberal arts college. Then I transferred to Georgetown thinking, maybe I'll get into politics or public service. But, you know, very shortly thereafter, I realized, no way, that's not going to work out. It's not for me. So then I was left thinking, you know, what am I going to do? And ultimately, I decided to go into entrepreneurship where I can create new things in the world for other people. And eventually went to Harvard Law School, stuff like that, passed the bars. But long story short is that's how I got into business. My characteristics, the way I am, actually play very well in business. It's sort of a, you know, the shoe fits the foot there really well for me. And it's very natural for me. It's one of the few things I've done where I didn't have to really force myself, like, you know, law school, getting a CPA, stuff like that was a, like a force fit for me. I had to really focus and push myself into it. Whereas in entrepreneurship and business, much more natural for me. But right now I'm very hyper-focused on what I think is my biggest next thing that, that I should create. And that is new tech leadership because I'm, you know, the technology leadership right now that we have is in control of so much of communication systems, which underbeds really the free world. You need to be able to have dialogue and be able to communicate in a free way without people censoring, blocking, or pushing things and manipulating things behind the scenes. And that technology leadership and that, that whole entire ecosystem is basically monopolized in an area that's radicalized, radical left. And they're intent upon imposing onto the free world their positions, and their positions are very far left. And they don't, I don't think they realize it because they've come through like the industrial complex of the university system where they were brainwashed, they walked into companies that further washed them. And then, you know, they think they're probably moderate, but they're very far left. And I moved my company out of that atmosphere to Texas. And the catalyst of that was COVID and a lot of the stuff that was going on at, at that time. But I had been building up an awareness that we need to do something different and build a different tech ecosystem somewhere else. And I didn't quite know it was going to be Texas, but 
after thinking it through, I decided on Texas. So we moved the whole company to Texas to do that. I noticed that. I, so I found that to be another interesting aspect of your background. Now, so you started off in, I guess, real estate investing, and then you moved into maybe, I don't know how to describe it, like a, you kind of techified it in some way? Yeah. So it, I bought a couple billion dollars of real estate. That was one of my first bigger plays in business. But while I was doing that along the way, I realized that technology was even more scalable and a bigger play to impact people. You know, you could build technology in one spot and you could be selling your services in India or elsewhere. And before I fully jumped into that decision, I actually went to about 85 countries across the world over a year and a half and got on the ground, had over a thousand meetings with different people over the course of a year and a half to help really concretize my thinking on how to build you know, a long-term impact. Because I had drafted before that a 60-year plan that I was working against. So some of these things are iterative as I'm going. I didn't necessarily have the idea concretely to build a new tech ecosystem, but that sort of came into clarity to me when I was out on the West Coast that that was a very big play. And that's what I'm working on now out of Texas. And the real estate aspect is my entry point. I'm looking at real estate as an area I know cold from construction all the way up to the financing to the private equity side and through and through. So, And it's an area that's a huge asset class. It's four times bigger than the global stock market's $280 $280 trillion asset class. It's undisrupted. And so we're coming at that from multiple angles. We already have two companies up and going, and we have a few others in the wings that are incubating right now that are coming out as well. So we're coming at it on multiple fronts. And the idea here is not just to disrupt real estate and recreate how things are done there. It's additionally to get going an ecosystem out of Texas that will take leadership from Silicon Valley and be very different than Silicon Valley in a place like Texas where faith, family, freedom reign. When people use the term big tech, they generally have in mind companies like Facebook, Amazon, companies like that, gigantic companies that have an enormous impact on our daily lives. And particularly, we tend to think of social media. So not just Facebook, but Twitter, YouTube. I mean, those would be the big three among social media. And so the leadership in those companies are are what has such an important impact impact on the lives of so many people, the information they're allowed to see, the information they're allowed to convey, the videos they're allowed to post. A lot of people now have to think twice before posting a video because they fear they're going to lose their entire channel. They can try these other video platforms like Odyssey, which I use in addition to YouTube. But the trouble is it's taking a while to get enough people over there to make it seem like it's worth content creators while to do it. So that's the real challenge. So you are you know, in tech generally, but this is the area, the area of social media is where the pernicious effects of, of let's say, the groupthink in big tech is felt the most. Have you thought about what can be done in that specific area, even though it's not in your particular wheelhouse? Yeah, I mean, I have strong opinions on this. You know, that is, I would say, very different than almost everyone I've heard on the topic. I don't think, I mean, we're not going to be able to change things by going after Facebook or YouTube or whatever we want to go after. This is a much larger problem. It's a problem of the technology ecosystem being monopolized in in one area. I mean, 80% plus of capital and venture capital comes out of, you know, 20 miles by 20 miles in an area that's radicalized. And thinking that we're going to just go a one-off and go after Facebook or go after something else, that's not going to work. Additionally, I mean, I could get into why a little bit more fleshing that out for you, why that's a bit of a fool's errand due to their network effects and other reasons. But that aside, let's pretend we could take it down and we could actually take down their monopoly and take down Google's monopoly very quickly. But even if we do that, that's just going to solve symptoms. The deeper problem here is that these trees are bearing poisonous fruit and they're coming out of a certain area. And the area that they're coming out of is the problem because it's become radicalized. So we've got to actually build an entire new ecosystem so we're not dependent on their technologies elsewhere. And I'll get into a little bit. Let me explain why now, because this is an important point. And I need to give the reasoning out so people can understand what I'm seeing here, because a lot of it was intuitive for me, how I noticed it. But basically, you you know, you can control, you can see the problems you're seeing is on Facebook and these other companies, right? But they're doing similar things, all of them. They're, you know, they tend to be bigoted in the same way. But if you go and solve all that, that's not going to solve the issue. And how do you solve it anyways? Through the law, through government? Well, then you start putting constrictions on it that's going to stamp out future entrepreneurs that can actually dethrone them. So that's not going to work well either. And additionally, you have another problem, right? Down to the metal. I say that we have to disrupt things in tech down to the metal. The metal is the hardware, the servers. So if they're controlling your servers, 
you don't even need Facebook and these other groups to really block you or deplatform you. They could deplatform you at the server level, whether it's AWS or whoever it might be. But all those companies are located in the same areas. It's basically Seattle and San Francisco, and they're both radicalized. And then you have hardware like phones. So they can also deplatform you on phones. And the two major phones are the iPhone or the Android system, which is controlled by Google and Apple, both in Silicon Valley. So you have a situation where our entire communication systems end to end are controlled out of a certain area and created out of a certain area. And the technology talent is there. And so is the capital. So we have to actually raise our eyes towards a 20-year build out. And that's what I'm working on. And I'm getting going. And I need backers to help get this going. But that's the vision I'm working on. Not just backers of me, but backers of anybody like me or of similar values that are libertarian, conservative, faith-driven, whatever you might want to call it. Basically, people that want to see a free world and want to see human beings flourishing. And we need to get that going outside of Silicon Valley. And I think localization is very important. And putting it in a place like Texas, where you're surrounded by 30 million people, not all of which necessarily agree with you, but many, many, many of which do, and they're fiercely independent-minded type people, is, I think, the proper area to build a competing ecosystem to Silicon Valley. And that's, that's what I'm working on. So I'll, I'll stop there and kind of get your thoughts on that, Tom. Well, I remember maybe 10 years ago looking at Facebook and thinking, you know, even though we fight on Facebook here and there, I, I, I think it wasn't as bad as it is now, but there were political, you know, arguments as there will be always. And I remember thinking as, as bad as that is and annoying as that is, what's nice about Facebook is that you have so many people from all over the world who are meeting here who can talk to each other, who can express ideas they might not have been exposed to otherwise. And we can, in some cases, have fruitful conversations. We can learn things. And it's something that it's not just for conservatives or just for libertarians or just for liberals or whatever. It's Facebook isn't called that. It's just called Facebook. So that it's just, it's for everybody. And now it looks like because of the balkanization of America, and it's an ideological balkanization rather than a racial one, because of that, we're moving toward a world in which there is going to be like a liberal Facebook and a not liberal Facebook. And it looks like we're heading toward parallel institutions. And there are people who think, well, that's good because then that means we won't be at each other's throats anymore and we'll have the kind of services that each group wants and we won't be fighting all the time. But on the other hand, there are some people who say, but that original vision, the idea of a big global meeting place where people of all different sorts could meet and exchange ideas, could that really have just been an illusion that we could never really have had that after all? What do you think about that? You know, I think we can have it, definitely. And I think it's a bit of an anomaly where our community, I mean, really, the communication systems and our media is no longer going to be, you know, old school TV and other things like that, right? It's going to be coming through these platforms where people are going to communicate. So that's going to be where we need to preserve free speech and make sure that that happens. So I don't think we have a choice but to make sure that that free dialogue happens. And I think what you're saying is we'll end up with two different sides. We'll have like a, you know, like a liberal one and then you have like a conservative one or, or whatever, right? But I would say that I don't think that's going to be good, first of all, because you, you need to hear both sides of an argument. It's kind of like, you know, one of the few good things you learn in, uh, in law school or that I learned that could be applicable to business is you want to hear both sides of the argument. So if you're, you come to a judge, right, everyone has a right to be defended no matter how much evidence is against them. They have a right to hear the defense, to have a defense, right? And the reason why is because when you hear opposing sides, well-litigated, well-positioned, the judge is better able to decide through, you know, common law. This was sort of iteratively developed in, in the British system. And we found it to be now the best way to make decisions, right, on right or wrong. But I think that also applies to anything politically. We need to hear all sides. And I don't even like identifying myself as conservative or libertarian or whatever. And I, I've always tried to escape being identified as anything. I probably am properly identified as Christian libertarian leaning, definitely Christian, but that's more a matter of faith, but libertarian leaning. But, but even that, I would say it depends, right? Everything's contextual. And for example, I was looking at some of your stuff, Tom, yesterday, as you were looking at my stuff, I was looking at yours, right? And you know, I was very intrigued. Uh, just your positions are very challenging intellectually. And they're positions that I haven't heard other people say and take a stance on. Now, you could be wrong about a number of these things. Now, obviously, you think you're right. But I don't know if you're right or wrong. And I'm glad you're saying some of these things. And I would like to understand some of those positions better. In the future, I can look at a lot of your content to do so. But it challenges us to broaden our mind and to see things differently. And I think when we create 
the next platforms that come out, we've got to make sure these conservative libertarians don't do the same thing back that was done to them. We don't use bigotry and go to stamp out people's opinions that are opposing because that's all that's going to do is put blinders on us and lead us into darkness as a country, as a nation, as, and people globally as well are going to be led into a darkness where you actually don't know what is true or what's not true because you don't have challenging positions. Folks, let's take a brief moment for me to spread some happiness. What do I mean by that? Every month, and I checked, I subscribed August 13th, 2019. So every month for two years, I have received a piece of happiness in my mailbox. And if you want to be a hit with your significant other, you will follow in my footsteps. Now, what is that bit of happiness? It is the happily date box. Every month we get a box with a different theme inside containing a music playlist and activities of all kinds and games and conversation starters that bring you closer together with your significant other. Sometimes it's competitive, sometimes it's cooperative, but it's always fun and relaxing. We've had boxes with an 80s theme, a Japan theme, a stargazing theme, all kinds of different things that help give us a special night together. Show your significant other that you value time together by checking out the Happily Date Box. And because you know all Woods, take 50% off your first date at tomwoods.com slash date. You know, at first, when, let's say, controversial people ran into trouble, they were deplatformed, or maybe in some cases, really controversial people couldn't get hosting for their site or, or whatever. Then it got to a point where a social media outlet like Gab was getting banned even by payment processors. So Visa, PayPal, Stripe, Square, even a couple of uh, Bitcoin platforms like uh, Coinbase and BitPay wouldn't transact them. Now, eventually, apparently, they figured something out. But so in other words, the potential for the throttling of different views goes very deep. It's not just a matter of hosting. It's not just a matter of my Facebook page got taken away. It goes really, really deep. Now, you may say, but those are only extreme voices, and most people can still get, well, okay, but I, that's how I thought about all the platforms until quite recently, and now it looks as if obviously quite innocent content is being taken down. So is there a plan in place, at least in your mind, as to how to get around that problem? Yeah, and I, and I think my plan is a, is a long-term plan, though, and, and what you're saying is all true and it's all alarming and it's a big problem. And I think that the people in Silicon Valley and Seattle have become emboldened because they got away with multiple interferences in the election. I mean, in my, in my perspective, if, if Russia did what Facebook and Twitter did, we'd have, a, we'd have a war on our hands with how much they got in, involved in trying to interfere with news that was going to people so that they can influence their decisions coming up to, leading up to the vote and then aggressively you know, getting involved in bias type action. Now, I think the answer to how we solve this, though, is not going to be like a, a linear approach where we're going to go after one or, or the other of these things. We need to actually build a new tech ecosystem, a new leadership system you know, somewhere else. And I'm doing it out of text. So I think that's the proper place to do it. And I would give the analogy, it's kind of like, it would be like you know, Middle Eastern oil, right? The world was very dependent on that oil for a while. And I would imagine that some of the real reasons why we had to stay involved in there in the Middle East was due to the oil situation because we're dependent on our economies completely dependent. So is all the West, right? So really, once you saw fracking and technology innovation in that area, and we were able to get oil consistently out of the Permian Basin, I think we actually broke dependency there. And I think that enables us to not be so involved out of there. And I would imagine that that is some of the unspoken you know, reason why we're able to withdraw without having economic disaster or consequences where they could really hold you hostage. But in order to do that, I mean, that took you know years and years of building out of the Permian Basin, which is the Midland Basin in Texas, where now they have a world-class ecosystem with pipelines. They have the talent. They have everything they need is right there. Now, the only thing that's not there right now is a good administration that allows people to do what they got to do, right? But that's a separate point. But, but that, I think, really freed up the world. And I think those people that did that are unsung heroes because that really, and I was out in the Middle East actually when this was, when they were starting to hit their, hit their pace, the frackers were, and the people in the Middle East were just like shocked. They were like, you know, how low can these guys go on price of barrel? And that was breaking up the cartel, which was setting prices. And 
If you look at the monopoly on tech, I think we have a similar cartel type behavior. Maybe they're not, all, they're not all coordinated as such, but they all certainly are believing a radical ideology that is now causing them to do a number of things and to discriminate, to be bigoted against people, to hold their voices down. And they're emboldened because they got away with you know, interfering with different things in the election of the president, which is you know, basically the most important thing that could happen in our society that is dependent on a democratically elected president to get interfere with that. If you can get away with that, you can basically get away with whatever you'd like. So I think they've been emboldened and they're radicalized. And I don't think the CEO, say Mark Zuckerberg or whoever the CEOs might be, are so much in control anymore. These companies are big. So they're filled with the local players that have come out through that ecosystem are in thousands of different spots controlling how things are going and setting algorithms and basically putting into the DNA of the company their own biases. Do you talk to many people in the tech area who maybe they don't, they're not super public about it, but in their heart of hearts, they're also uncomfortable about the culture surrounding so-called big tech? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are, I've been outspoken about this, probably one of the most outspoken people about this in the tech industry. And we are capturing a lot of the people that are tired of it. They see it as a threat to humanity. They are coming to our company and we're able to capitalize on that by being an open company that is a company that's not going to do that. So we're getting people moving from San Francisco, from Seattle to our company and from you know some of the smaller tech ecosystems like New York or Chicago also coming in as well, but mainly San Francisco, Seattle. And I think that I think there is a minority of people there. And I think it's a large minority. Potentially, it's a majority. Who knows? You know, Ronald Reagan would talk about the silent majority, right? So there could be a majority. There's definitely a lot of people, though. They're just, they're kind of busy with their families and they're, they're busy doing good things. So they don't get too involved. And they're also worried about downside coming out because the leadership there could, could actually, you know, it could compromise your career or they could straight just, you know, fire you or something. Who knows what, what's in their mind, what they're worried about but there's social consequences to stepping out. And the media makes it seem as though everybody uniformly thinks this, even though it's not true, but socially what that does to the mind, I think, is it makes someone feel like, oh, I can't say anything. I'll be you know, one against a million here, where actually, I don't think it's one against a million. I think it's probably you know, maybe 70, 30 out there. And I think the rest of the world is more 70, 30 on our side or, not, or 80, 20 on our side. And they see it a problem with them, so... Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that not everybody feels just by temperament cut out to be that one bold voice standing against the world. So if you can give the impression that that's what would happen, that you would be one bold voice against the world, you can take some of these more perfectly good, upstanding people, but more timid sorts of people and intimidate them into just staying silent. And incidentally, you were talking about the consequences they might face. I have a case of a group of professional filmmakers, and I mean, these are people who have been involved in major movies you and I have both heard of, and they wanted to make and are in the process of making a documentary about the COVID response, about what the government did, about some of the human interest stories, about what happened to people because of the lockdowns, that tells these forgotten stories, the stories of what happened because of the restrictions and whether the restrictions did much good and places that had them and places that didn't and compare them. And they want to do this. This obviously needs to be done, but they have to do it anonymously, even though they have credentials like you wouldn't believe. And that would obviously help them with fundraising. In fact, when they came on my podcast, I was not allowed to say their names to the audience. I mean, that's a real, real problem. But, you know, on the other hand, they did step up and that's great. So it didn't prevent the project from happening altogether. That is true. But it's unbelievable that in the United States, people should have to work under these conditions. Absolutely, Tom. And I think if you look at so look at what the consequences of this is, right? As they're doing this, what, what you're going to have, what anybody who's reasonable right now doesn't believe the media, right? Anybody that wasn't just born yesterday. And I don't just mean people on the right. I mean, also people on the left. I don't think anybody who's got any sense of street smarts believes the media. I mean, they're just on its face, have discredited themselves so much. And this type of behavior where they're stamping out alternative voices, they're stamping out opposing views, all it does is lead to more distrust because because you have a situation where whether they realize it or not, these leaders, these tech leaders, I call it big tech, big media, big government. These big tech, big media, big government leaders who are sort of all in agreement and incestuous relationship together, they, they are effectively showing themselves to be very, very arrogant. And they think they know the truth. They have a monopoly on the truth. So they're going to come out and like, 
you know, hit people with sticks over COVID or, you know, forcing people to debate, take vaccines or whatever it might be. And the thing is, you know, for someone like me is I don't know, like when COVID was first coming out, I couldn't figure it out. Well, what's going on here? How dangerous is this thing? I had to do a lot of firsthand research where I had to go deep into the data and try to figure out death rates on my own because I, I couldn't trust any source of media. That's not a good situation where someone who, you know, I'm very good at researching. I had to spend hours to figure this out because I have kids. So I was worried. I have four kids. I was worried about, you know, how at risk are these kids? And then, I, you know, obviously the Chinese data, you couldn't believe anything. So you had to wait for some Western data. But the Western data is so manipulated and on its surface, it's hard to figure out what's going on. You got to dig really deep to figure it out. But all this does is, is when you're shutting these people down, even if they're wrong, let them just say their piece. Because when you allow a vibrant public square and the new public square is online, when you allow that to happen, these people, you know, if they're wrong, you know, they will just prove themselves to be wrong through argumentation. And, and the people are smart as a whole. When they hear different composing views, they'll figure it out. They might take a little longer than some like genius might figure it out. Who knows? But even, you know, even like you or me or anybody that's well-educated, we have our own blindnesses. We, we get blinded by our own ideas. We get blinded by the books we read and our own intellectual BS, right? And I've noticed that a lot of men on the street, a lot of people I'm friends with, they'll call things quicker than I see them. So it's like, all we're doing, we're shutting these opposing voices down. We're going to get in a dangerous situation where we probably already in, in one, right? Where people don't trust any media sources. Now, if something serious happens, they just start questioning it and don't know if they believe it or not. And you get also certain type of people are going to get further radicalized. I mean, a good example of this is it wasn't so bad, say, four years ago, what was going on, but it still was pretty bad. I mean, people in San Francisco were literally, I was there, were literally crying about Trump being elected. They had mental breakdowns. They couldn't go to work. I was at you know, church and the pastor actually had to talk about it, like, hey, listen, you know, life's going to go on, guys. Relax. Because he was getting hit up by so many people that needed counseling. And it's just why would it be like that, that it was so traumatizing? I mean, this guy is not Hitler, but in their brain, they had become convinced that he was. Well, if they heard opposing views, they'd realize how absurd that is. I mean, maybe the guy's, obviously he's obnoxious. He's, you know, was a playboy, whatever you might say, right? No one's perfect, but he certainly wasn't Hitler. That type of stuff is dangerous, right? You get these people thinking in these radicalized formats and they could start seeing someone as Hitler. Well, what are you going to do with Hitler? Well, you're going to censor him. You're going to block him. You're going to try to make sure he doesn't get elected because you're doing your duty. And anyways, I'll let you go from there, Tom, but that's my perspective on it. Well, as we wrap up, let me ask you this. I'm going to get some correspondence after this episode airs from people who have major tech talents and who have a brain for this kind of stuff and who want to know, okay, well, Peter Rex is, we don't want to say declaring war, but he's declaring uh, something. He's declaring that we need to take some action. This isn't going to fix itself. We have to be proactive and go out there and create something of our own. So they're going to want to know, well, what should I do? What does he want me to do? What specific course of action should I take? What kinds of things should I be doing to contribute to that effort? Well, yeah, there's three cohorts of people I would talk to and of your listeners, and I think almost all of them will fall into one of the three. And I think what I need them to do is I need them to stop complaining and do something. You know, complaining is not helping. Let's go. Let's just do something. I, I, anytime I'm complaining about something, I always think, you know what, I'm either going to shut up or I'm going to do something. So either we're going to shut up and let these guys just run our lives and declare what we can say and what we can't, or we're going to do something. And I'm doing something and I need backing. I need capital. So if people got money. I need investors. Secondly, and likely more importantly, is I need more and more talent. An elite talent is what I'm looking for in the tech industry. And the third thing is we need broad support from people like you, Tom, and other people out there that are part of like an alliance of sorts that we need to create because we need to get this alliance going because that entity, Silicon Valley, you know, it's an ecosystem that, you know, I don't think people understand it. They definitely do not understand it. It is incredibly powerful. You know, it wasn't born in the last five years. This thing has been building up over almost a hundred years now. I would say probably 80 years, you might say. It's been a product of many different hands creating it, but they have massive capital. They have an insane level of talent over there. I mean, you could walk in the street and just throw a dart and hit someone that's an expert in machine learning, anything, you you know, you just name it, you can get a meeting in 15, 20 minutes with somebody. And that is something that even in Austin, Texas, I'm based in the capital of Texas in Austin, we're building out of, we do not have those advantages. So we are fighting at a disadvantage. And I knew that coming here. But there is no other way. We have to build a new ecosystem and we got to just start going to work, man, putting our shoulder behind it and building like crazy. 
And we need a lot. We need, like I said, just the three cohorts. We need capital, so investors, aligned investors. Second, we need talent, elite talent. And third, we need supporters like you who are part of our alliance, who we will try to develop mutual beneficial relationships with to help develop our thinking, to help build a new tech foundation here out of Texas. If people want to find out more about you, your website is rex.com? Yeah, rex.com, rex.com. All right, I'm going to direct people there. I'll put that on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1994. And I think I'll also put the video of the talk you gave at Hillsdale College. Was that about a year ago or so, would you say? It was, but I mean, I you know I was so ahead of the curve on that. I even said that coming out. I'm like, damn, we're probably like ahead of the curve on this thing. But we are the, yeah, that was at Hillsdale. But it's very relevant today. They can listen to that end to end and they'll, anything I said there is completely relevant right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I just wanted to make sure it wasn't like eight years ago or something because that, no, but yeah, yeah we've just, been in this. Yeah, it was about 11 months ago. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So I'll put all this stuff up at tomwoods.com slash 1994. Well, listen, you can't possibly not be a busy guy. So I appreciate you carving out a little time for the Tom Woods Show today. All of us do. Thank you. Yeah, Tom, thanks a lot for all you do and keep up the good work. All right, folks, that's our episode for today. Tomorrow, I'm going to revisit an old classic. Not that old, I guess. Old for some of you young whippersnappers who listen anyway. An old essay. Again, why do I keep saying old? It's from the late 1990s, but it hasn't been discussed as much as it should be, involving what our big picture for strategy ought to be. Not the little details, we can hammer those out, but what is our big picture strategy for establishing the kind of society that we want? I want to be talking about that tomorrow, so I will see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.